When you sit in the waiting room at LMC's Family Health Clinic, you almost always get to watch HGTV. That's the channel with all the home improvement and real estate reality shows. From fantasy and celebrity makeovers to flips and new construction to DIY instruction to sales, they've got a show that covers your home and garden interests. I myself, though it's not on the channel, am, have long been a fan of this old house, from Bob Vila all the way to Kevin O'Connor. And by the way, who can forget the classic movie, The Money Pit, with Tom Hanks and Shelley Long. But it's always the same old thing. At the end of the day, the homeowners still have an old house that's just a little more up to date. And even when it's new construction, by the time they move in, everything that was trendy when they picked it is now out of date. And in a few short months, everything else will be out of warranty, making it now an old house. As soon as the tools are set down, the maintenance and the decay set in. Everything new is old again, we might say. But too often, this kind of remodeling and upgrading fantasy frames our vision of eternal life in our resurrected bodies. We think it'll be just like this one, but better. All of our old parts will be replaced with new ones. And the parts we don't like will be redone to, to our satisfaction. No arthritis, even cancer. No rainouts for fishing and hunting and golfing. No credit card bills, no chores, no limits eating our favorite food in our brand new giant kitchen with an island and French doors and shiplap. It'll be an endless cruise and stay at Club Med. Everything will be absolutely fabulous. However, we simply can't upgrade and renovate all of those things listed for us in verse 8 of Revelation 21. All those things we cringe at cowardliness, faithlessness, pollution, murder, fornication, sorcery, idolatry, lying, all of those things cannot simply be redecorated out of existence. They come from our hearts. So the new heaven and earth and the new bodies, our new home with God forever, which we are promised in Revelation and of which we hear today, are not at all a leveling up to a new set of finishes and trims and materials at an ever higher price point, which God is splurging on for us. Now, a few other stories might come to mind as we consider this new home for us that Revelation 21 promises. Perhaps we remember that when God appeared on Mount Sinai, Following the Exodus, giving the Ten Commandments, we hear God telling Moses, You shall set limits for the people all around the mountain, saying, Be careful not to go up to the mountain or touch the edge of it. Any who touch the edge of the mountain shall be put to death. And then later, regarding the tabernacle, and then applied later still to the temple, the Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron, not to come just at any time into the sanctuary inside the curtain before the mercy seat that is upon the ark, or he will die. For I appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. See, the gist of these stories is that God's presence among his people is not something to be trifled with, not to be played with. Our frail and sinful humanity cannot bear the fullness of God's infinite presence and holiness. Indeed, that's why those things are outlawed in Revelation 21, that list at the end. Now later on in, God, in the Gospel according to St. John, we read this. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory. Something is new, isn't it? Later on in the same Gospel, Jesus says, 
the Father and I are one. By taking human flesh upon himself, wrapping himself in our humanity, God's presence among us becomes bearable, tolerable. Yes, but it's not quite what we're looking for. How about God's presence becomes for you? Those two great words we hear each week in Holy Communion. In the flesh and blood of Jesus, we know that God is for us in His grace, mercy, and love. His holiness and presence are not opposed to us. Much like we say in the Creed, for us and our salvation, He came down from heaven. The ancient church father, St. Athanasius, has a quote in his short book on the Incarnation. He writes, For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. And the standard English translation there is a little clunky. But it's square with what we read in 2 Peter 1. He has given us through these things his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become participants of the divine nature. And what we hear in 1 John 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. So St. Athanasius' little phrase there becomes a, a saying, an aphorism you find in church history and theology. He became as we are, so we may become as he is. In fact, go ahead and get your yellow sheets out. They're in your bulletins, right? We've got a question on one side. But flip over to the back side and write that down. Write that down in the notes section. I'll wait for you. Get your page out. Pens are there in front of you. I'll give you a second. They're in that notes section, that big blank spot. Write this down. He became as we are so that we may become as he is. He became as we are so that we may become as he is. In other words, it's an entirely new way of being with God. Now, of course, we know that this day promised to us in Revelation 21 is still to come. That's guaranteed to happen because God said it will, and God's words do not return to him empty. They accomplish his purpose. And yet we still suffer, and we still weep, shedding our tears. We still must face death. We still live distantly as if God isn't really around. In our world today, he's sort of an option or an accessory for our lives, something we choose to have or not as it fits us. Really, at best for most people, it seems God is like an app that runs in the background, logging everything we do, so he's ready to go if we ever want him. Now, all of that is to our detriment, especially when we consider that God already connects our present to his future. His eternal presence is plonked right down upon us in everyday life. Now, I'm not talking about your heart, where you feel all the feels, or some other kind of warm fuzzy. But rather, here in worship, in biblical, orthodox, faithful, holy, traditional, liturgical, indeed ancient worship, we experience here and now already a taste of what is promised to us on that day. God's presence here in worship is not something we manufacture by our good behavior or by our efforts or our songs and praises. It's not a contract that if we do this, sing certain songs in a happy way, then he will do that, show up in our happy feelings. God's here because he says he is. All the way from, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age, to what we hear today. See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. 
They will be his peoples. From the invocation of his name to his personal forgiveness of our sins, to his proclaimed word, to his holy supper, to the Holy Spirit who carries our intercessions and prayers, to the unity given to us in baptism and so forth. God is here with us regardless of our thoughts and feelings. And what's more is that we bring our experiences of death and tears and mourning and crying and pain with us to worship. We have no need to cover them or hide them with inauthentic feelings. Besides, those pains and tears are still there, whether they're covered up or not. God desires to wipe them away and to heal them, even to the point of death, overcoming it with the resurrection of our own bodies. Do we have more than one set of tears and pains to wipe away? Yeah, certainly. That's why going to church one time doesn't fix us. But why else for things such as funerals, baptisms, forgiveness and healing, liturgical daily prayer be worship services if it were not to put us there with God's loving, healing heart. And now for you, <clears throat> for you graduates in confirmance, each of you is entering in a new way back out into the hostile world. To the world, you're just a dollar sign, a commodity to be traded, a gain to be realized. And, you know, if that causes you pain and tears, well, believe it or not, there's money to be made off of those too by somebody. However, to your heavenly Father, you are his beloved child, who he desires to nurture and to comfort, to mentor and to teach, to live with and to provide for. Because, as he says, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He goes before you and comes along after you. And in those moments of pain and sorrow and death, when those things poke through your carefully managed and upgraded public profile, don't simply go, but run home to church to worship like this, where God is already wiping away those things in anticipation of the last day when they are no more and you will live with him forever. That little memorable turn of phrase from St. Athanasius, he became as we are, so we may become as he is, captures what Revelation, still no S, what Revelation 21 tells us. Because we who are so used to, who so much take for granted pain and sorrow and tears and death and so forth, all of it rooted in, in sin and sinfulness, we must be made new, not merely better, not faster, higher, stronger, like the Olympic slogan. And yes, there's a continuity that exists between what was and what is and what will be. However, sin and death and corruption will entirely and truly disappear. The redeemed world, with our redeemed bodies, will be transformed and entirely new according to God's perfect intentions. Which he tells us, quite plainly, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. Not the way he was on Mount Sinai or the way he was in the tabernacle in the temple, but like the way he is present for us in his son Jesus who dwelt among us and is present for us in worship where he gives himself to us in word and sacrament and comes to us in comfort and consolation, hearing our prayers and receiving our praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.